telling us a bit more about yourself, where you're coming from, and so on? And, sure. Uh, and then you're going to leave lots of time, I guess, for questions. Absolutely, yeah. Questions are much more interesting. So this will be something uh, learning for all of us here. So yes. Go ahead. Thanks. Pleasure. Um, great. So uh, I teach the class right before you, and so I was just running into John as you guys were coming and going. I said, oh my god, he's going to, so we have a quid pro quo, because he's going to come and teach some fishery stuff to uh, my, my class. I'm teaching resource economics, uh, and actually I'm uh, from California, and I uh, did a PhD in agricultural and resource economics, and I got into water management. And as I got into water, uh, I got into not just urban water management, but also human rights in water, agricultural irrigation in water, water in the environment, which gets you into fisheries, which gets you into other resources called fish or resources called trees and so on. And so um, I, I have gotten, uh, I have a peripheral interest in all kinds of different things. Um, oh, as a lecturer, I have a hard time with people who are reading while, they're, while I'm lecturing. So if you're taking notes, go ahead, but please don't read Facebook. Um, so, I was teach, I, I've taught at Berkeley before uh, resource economics and, or environmental economics and policy, and now I'm doing resource economics. And so what I put a lot of emphasis on with my classes is, is not just the economics and certainly not the mathematical economics, which is a whole bunch of derivatives and so on that scientists think are really funny but also don't represent what's going on, but I spend a lot of time on institutions and the way that we manage various resources. Uh, water is a, a resource that can also be an environmental good. The water that you drink is different than the environmental water that flows in the river. Uh, fish can also be an environmental good in the sense of uh, fish that are living on a reef, uh, but also they can be a resource in terms of something that's valuable to consume. So people are uh, eating fish as well. And the problem uh, most of the time with uh, fisheries is that uh, we tend to eat more fish than there are. Right? We eat them on an unsustainable level. We eat, uh, and, there's, and, and there's some version of a tragedy of the commons. This is the expression that's used all the time, and I'll talk about that quite extensively today. Uh, not just about that in theory, but also different ways that that's been addressed in fisheries, in my experience, uh, and reading. So the first thing I want to point out, actually, as far as uh, what economists, uh, how great economists think they are, is that the original Tragedy of the Commons was written in 1968 by a guy named Hardin, uh, and uh, there's two things that are interesting about that paper. The first is that his analogy, have you guys all read this paper? Have you not read this paper? Okay, good. I will back up and give you this uh, story here. So the idea of a commons is an area where everybody has access to the commons. And imagine that you've got a bunch of houses around a commons, and this is supposedly an English commons, and they're going to put their sheep to graze on the commons. And these are my version of sheep, right, because I'm such an illustrator. So you've got the sheep on the commons. And the economic decision to put the sheep on the commons is, I will put the sheep on the commons, I will get a personal benefit, because my sheep will get fatter eating the grass, and the cost will accrue to everyone, in a sense, because we all own it together. It's a collective good. In economics, we say that a commons is a non-excludable but a rival good. Okay? Private property, like your laptop, it's a personal computer, right? It's rival that you can own it, but someone else can't own it, and it's excludable. When you put it under your arm, you, you have it, right? A commons is something that's non-excludable. Anybody here with a house can put a sheep on the commons. It's not private property. It's owned collectively by everybody. So the tragedy of the commons would occur if many, 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 many sheep show up on the field, and I'm going to draw them with, without arms. These are, these are no-headed sheep. They'll end up on the field, and they'll eat all the grass. And the tragedy is, is that after a while, there's so many sheep that there's no grass, and then you have no uh, uh, resource, right? You've, you've, you've destroyed that commons. This is what Hardin wrote about in 1968. Now there's two things that are interesting about that. Number one is that his example was wrong. Because what Eleanor Ostrom pointed out a few years later, which is why she won the Nobel Prize in economics, and Ostrom was a political scientist, is, hey, I wonder what happens when you get a commons and people have sheep. So she went to places where people had commons and sheep, and, they figure, and she figured out by asking them, what do you guys do? 
How do you do it? And they're like, well, you know, on Tuesday, Juan goes out, on a Wednesday, uh, Jose goes out, and on Thursday, they just have a way. They find a way of managing their commons. They find a way of keeping this area within its carrying capacity, right, to use the biological expression. And so there is an auto tragedy. So that commons might be used for hundreds of years. So the example, of, of course, and the phrase is very, very significant, and it does apply often, but his example was wrong. And the hint of why it was wrong is the hint of how to solve those problems of the commons, which I'll get into in a second. The other thing that was interesting about the tragedy of the commons is that there was a fishery, uh, uh, sorry, there was a paper written uh, in 19, what it was. Oh, I, I threw off the uh, cover page here. 1956, I think, by a guy named H. Scott Gordon from Ontario. Carlson College, it's called Economic Theory of a Common Property Resource, the Fishery. He talked about the tragedy of the commons as far as fisheries are concerned a dozen years before Hardin did. I don't know if Hardin cited him. That would be interesting. You know, ac academics sometimes have little turf wars. But one of the, the point is, is that one of the earliest papers on the commons, which actually does apply, is about fisheries, right? So the fisheries have got uh, a lot of, of history with this problem. So there's a couple things that we can look at in terms of actions to prevent this from happening. The one thing Ostrom's solution, an institutional or collective community solution, I'll get to in a second, what that's called is converting this non-excludable rival good into a non-rival excludable good. And that's called a, that's called a club good because you've got to be a member of the club. If you're in the club, so you, the club can exclude people, right? The, we can lock the doors, we have a club here. And anybody who is in the club can sit and have a seat, but it's non-rival because there's plenty of chairs in our club. And if you have a fishery or you have a, a, a landscape that you have sheep on, you can make it excludable because you, people will say, are you live here, do, you, do we know you? And you can make it non-rival because they won't let on too many sheep. So that's essentially what Ostrom was talking about. So you can go from common pool to club good, or, of course, you can go to a private good, which is going to be excludable and uh, rival, but we get, we get that private good solution by sectioning off the commons into private property. You put fences around your uh, grass, and it's like, this is my grass, and, and if you screw up your own grass, that's your fault, but at least your neighbor won't suffer and vice versa, okay? So you can go from a common pool good to a private good or to a club good. Privatization is what's discussed in this thing, okay? And that is actually how a lot of uh, fisheries management solutions occur. There's, so there's, there's two stages of fisheries, let's say, or three stages of fisheries. One of them is going to be where you have this much biomass. This is me being a scientist, right? You have this much biomass, and you have this many fishermen. Fisher people, fisher folk they're called, I guess, men. Fisher folk, whatever. I don't know many women who want to go out and kill themselves on boats, but whatever. Guys are dumb. They'll do it. Um, so you've got way too much biomass for the number of fish, fish, right? Basically what you have here from an economic perspective is a, a non-excludable, I'm going to use an abbreviation now, non-rival good, which is a, a public good. This is an economic jargon. Public good is economic jargon. The expression for the public good is not the same thing as a public good, okay? A public good is non-excludable, non-rival. There's literally, anybody can go in, it's non-excludable and non-rival. There's way too many fish. That's how every fishery started. The first guy showed up and said, wow, a lot of fish. I can't even eat this many fish. Then more people show up and more people show up, right? And it goes from being non-excludable, non-rival to being non-excludable and rival. So it goes to becoming a common pool good. Now you've got a problem because there's, there's this many fisher folk, right? And we're having a problem with uh, consumption. So you can go from there, you can go in different directions. And 
most fisheries have some kind of history of what happened next, right? There's three things. One is uh, the fishery collapsed because it's overfished, basically. You literally do have a tragedy. This is the, the, the cod fishery off the coast of uh, Canada and the, the Atlantic US. Um, and some of the salmon fisheries. Or you can go to a privatization, which is uh, what has been used in uh, various countries, Iceland and Australia and New Zealand and the US and I, maybe Canada. Privatization is, is usually called individually transferable quotas. Transferable quotas. Have you guys discussed that? We haven't talked about it yet. Okay. So ITQs, individually transferable quotas, are basically the same idea as sectioning off that uh, property, the, 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 the land, except it's not sectioning the land, it's sectioning off the, the, the school of fish, the fishery. And it says more or less, individuals will get quota, you'll get 17 tons, you'll get 14 tons, you'll get 32 tons, you'll get 85 tons, whatever the quota is, usually it's based on some kind of grandfathering which is that you have done this much fishing in the past, and now we will give you a quota that represents your past success, let's say. Right? This is called, um, it's, it's grandfathering, but the reason the grandfathering happens is because if you didn't do it, you would have a rebellion right, among the fisher, the fisher folk. Okay? So what you say is, we're going to give you quota based on uh, your past consumption, or uh, production, your past catch. The key idea is that the, the the authority that issuing the quota wants to reduce the quota to keep it uh, into a sustainable level. Its, its maximum sustainable yield is usually the idea. Getting that right is difficult, let's say. Even if the biology is clear, I'll tell you right now, the, political, the politics of quota is that if the biologists put out an opinion and say it's 50 tons, the politicians will say 80 tons is okay. Right? Even though the biologists say, maximum, 45 tons is really conservative. I mean, it'd be, you know, but 50 tons, you're like maximum, and the politicians are like 80, whatever. They don't even listen. They're just, it's amazing. They ask for an opinion, they totally disregard it, right? So, and then the, the biologists come along and say, okay, how about 20 tons? And the politicians say, maybe 50. And the, bi the biologists are like, yes, okay. So you have to fool sometimes the politicians. It's a game. This is a... I, I see international, international conspiracy to catch all tuna, right? There's this uh, uh, international committee, whatever, right? But the committee, the, 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 the blue tuna, I think, or something that's in bluefin tuna, is a very valuable tuna. It's the sushi uh, tuna. And, and Japan has no interest in setting low quota on that. And they come up with these numbers and saying, the English can catch this, the Spanish can catch this, and they, and they come up with this number, which is whatever it is, 340 tons, and then they say, okay, 650 tons. They, just, they have just this ridiculous way of inflating the numbers. So anyway, that's one of the big games that goes on with these quotas. But on the other hand, when you have a fishery that is, for example, uh, the abalone fishery in Australia, and they issue these, permit, these, 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 these uh, quota permits, here is one of the most important factors. They're transferable. And that means you can buy and sell them among each other, right? And what happens is, the first year you get it, more or less it's worth zero, because you're kind of doing what you used to do. But as soon as they start to tighten down the ceiling and everybody is getting 10% you know, less quota, everybody's getting 10% less. So it reduces the problem with the commons. It will probably increase the, the productivity of the fishery, right, until they get it down to some level which is reasonable, but then there's all these, you know, there's all these physical shocks. This is the thing that the, they, they, off, they try and take into account, but the, but the politicians don't like, physical shocks and so on. Oh, it's the, the oscillation has changed the season and the fisheries have dropped by 60%. Oh, but go keep fishing anyway, right? So the science must be part of this process, but the, the, the human part of it, of taking the quota and reducing it, will get you to the point where these permits start to be worth a lot of money. And here's the important thing. When those permits, so your permits are worth $800,000, and your house is worth $200,000, you're going to pay a lot of attention to the permits. And if he's going and catching fish at midnight above, out of quota, you're going to put a hole in his boat, right? Or something more subtle, right? 
So they're actually, what ends up happening is the quota ends up getting enforced by the fishing community because it's in the best interest of all of the fisher folk to maintain the, the, the limit on the quota. This is, and that's a closed fishery where it's a s small community. This is how, for example, Maine lobster have been harvested for decades. They have a tradition, you put your trap here, my granddaddy put his trap there, and if you put your trap, I heard this from a, another fisheries economist, so I think it's true, but if you put your trap, if you're a new guy, you just go, oh, lobster's everywhere, I'll just put a fisher, you put a trap down, they'll tie a little knot, they have a little knot they can tie on the top of your trap. And you come back and look at it and say, hmm, somebody messed with my trap, that's crazy. And you like haul it up and you take all that guy's lobster. The next time your trap is not there, right? The next time your truck is in the water, right? So these guys, the fishermen are not known for being very, you know, diplomatic. And so what they do, what the guy told me about the abalone fishery is there were trucks thrown off cliffs from guys who were violating the quota. Because abalone, you could go um, skin diving and get them, right? So, if you're going to take my $800,000 value property and start destroying it because you're stealing from everybody, then I'm going to defend it. So what happens is the, the, those quotas end up becoming uh, an internally maintained, uh, uh, enforce, they, they're internally maintained it's, the enforcement is internally maintained, right? They have an incentive to stay within the quota. They're all watching each other, and this works all the time in small fishing communities. Uh, it, it will work much better in a small fishing community. Okay, and then they start, they, they might sell them, you know, an old guy wants to retire, he wants to sell it to whoever, uh, <clears throat> or someone's, uh, I want to buy a new boat, I'm going to sell some quota, I'll, I'll rent it back, I'll buy it back later, or whatever. I had a long, endless discussion with a guy uh, who lived up in Alaska who was very upset that quota was so expensive. And he's saying, it's just not fair, I want to fish. I said, well, you have got to find the money to buy the permits. And he's like, but I don't have the money. All the rich guys have the money. But that, unfortunately, is the point, right? Because the quota is not about helping young fishermen enter into the business. The quota is about maintaining a fishery so people can keep eating fish, really, right? Because if there's no, no fish, they're not going to buy them. And, um, and the, uh, the part about that that's important... Why are all the rich guys getting the fisheries? It's like, well, because it's a very heavy, heavy capital heavy business, and the guys who are investing because they want to have their returns, they're, they're just investing like anything else. But it's, it's just like saying, so-and-so lives in a, an expensive house. I want to live in that house. It's like, well, you've got to get the money to live in the house. If you don't have the money, you know, go live in a cheaper place, right? Go fish somewhere else. So it's, it's not fair for people who want to get started who are not clever and I'll come back to that in a second, but it is fair in terms of keeping the fishery going. And it is fair because it prevents the open access problem. If we wanted to get the guy started, we'd just let anybody, oh, you haven't fished before? Come in and catch all the fish you want, right? You have a couple free years of fishing, and then you have to deal with quota. In some ways, that's already been addressed when you have sport licenses, right? Or you have First Nations permits, they get to, to do the traditional hunting. You do want to separate it out re recreational and commercial fishermen. But the, um, what I say I was going to come back to in a minute. Uh, clever people can get in. If you don't have the, the money, you find someone who does have the money who believes in you as a fisherman, right? That's how you get in. You join a crew. And after 10 years or whatever the hell it is, someone will give you a boat. An investor will give you a boat. I want to own my boat. Well, fine, go buy a dinghy, right? But if you want to own a fishing boat, you have to have quota or whatever. It's just like any other business. I want to own my own department store also, but I don't have a building, right? So I don't ask you to give me a building. So unfortunately, it takes the romance out of fishing, but it puts sustain sustainability in the fishing, and it makes it a business that's going to work. Okay, so that's how this works. I want to give you a couple examples from, that economists use a lot as examples of how fisheries were collapsing and how they were recovered or whatever. One of them was, it's a, a quite famous case, and I don't have the, the dates or the publication, so sorry, I can probably look it up. The Alaska halibut fishery was in very big trouble, let's say, 30 years ago. The halibut are huge ground fish. They, are, they use trawlers that are scraping the bottom to get these fish. They catch them up. And the, fish, uh, the fishermen were very efficient at catching the fish. Like, be a, it could be a good pun. And they, used, uh, they had big boats with big motors, 
and the fishery started declining and declining and declining because these fish, they, I don't even know, they need probably 30 years to, to get to full size and they were taking them out after 10 years. So the, the size of the fish was dropping, the number of fish was dropping. This is never good as far as the fishery is concerned. Biomass and quality is dropping. The fishing season in Alaska for halibut, I believe, got down to six hours per year. Because the regulators, they said, we're going to shorten the season, shorten the season, shorten the season. So it was six hours, and what happened at 6.01 a.m. is these guys took their 17,000 horsepower boats and went Bzz! to try and race out there and catch as many fish as possible in the next six hours. They, just, they were dumping gear off, guys were losing fingers, they were using way too much fuel. Didn't matter what the weather was because the season starts on this date exactly, right? So what you had is very high cost fishing, the fish were mangled coming in. The market was glutted by fresh halibut. That's why when I, in the 1980s, frozen halibut, that's what you ate, right? Because all the halibut, 99% of the halibut were caught and, and, and in that day, and you have to freeze them. It's not like everybody's going to have halibut, halibut around the world that one day later, right? So they were freezing halibut. Another problem was the halibut um, freezing plants, there are only three of them. They kind of would sit there and go, oh, here come all the boats. We don't have to pay that much for fish, I guess because there's a whole bunch. So the, the price dropped, the cost is up, not a good situation for the fishermen. They introduced ITQs uh, and the, the fishery uh, changed substantially. The season went out to more or less nine months. The fishermen went out whenever they wanted to. They took their quota and they caught the fish that they wanted to. They caught larger fish because they, they were not overfishing. They caught fresh fish because they could bring it in when they ever wanted to, and you can get more money for fresh fish. They had time to catch the fish, so the fish were in better condition. They did not lose their fingers and use so much fuel because they could take their time. If it was a crappy weather, they'd stay in. All kinds of things went well for this fishery. I, as far as I know, that is still true. Sometimes when they don't go to quota, the reason this, this, this is the extreme it, met, it, it reached in, the, in Alaska, but what they would do is the regulators would put uh, regulations, sorry, the, the, the regulators in charge of the fishery would put regulations uh, and they would say, okay, your boat can only be this long. They would limit the number of boats, of course. They would say your boat can only be this long. It's called gear, you know, gear limitations. You, can, you, can, you can't use uh, 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 sane nets or, or per sane nets. How do you say that correctly? Per sane nets. Uh, the microfilament fibers, because they catch all kinds, there's all kinds of biocatch, or, or um, what's it called? Bycatch, bycatch. Uh, and so on. So they'd say, your boat is like this. Oh, your boat can only be this long? Great. We'll make a bigger boat. A bigger boat. They had these round tubs going out, right? They, they, they reached the length. It was ridiculous, right? But they were, they were trying to figure out a way to get more gear in the water, and more side would allow more gear to be thrown over the edge, or if they're long line fishing or whatever, they would just, you know, they, they had all these games going on. It's like the Formula One games where they say, oh, your car's going too fast. Now you can't use uh, you know, the deflectors to keep you on the ground, or now you can't use high uh, tires, sticky tires. It's always this game between the car mechanics and the regulators, and it was the same thing with the fishermen. The ITQ story just ended this all together, right? There's no point of having a game. You just go catch fish, which also was, which lowered their cost dramatically. Okay, so a couple examples. Let me, let me jump through a couple things and I'll get to the salmon one, which is one of the most ridiculous of all time. Uh, and I've got to stop because I can ask, take questions from you. So uh, rivers have been traditionally managed uh, often by First Nations. You have a salmon run and it'll be like they'll have the little weirs or the catches because like there's so many salmon coming you just like get a couple off. And, and those weirs would be owned by families, right? So that was a property right. This is my weir, everybody knows it, and they would get the fish. They would la allow the biggest fish to pass because more eggs would come back, they would keep the salmon fishery happy. That's how they manage that in certain places at certain times, etc. right? Ocean halibut, islands lobster. I went to, uh, I was on holiday in Honduras and there was a little island that I went to and these guys made their living off of tourists and lobster. And this guy was telling me an interesting story about how the mainland guys, Honduras is a very poor country, they would drive their boats over from the mainland and come and get the lobster. And the guys would say, hey, police, come and get these guys. They're breaking the law. They're taking a lobster. And the police are like, yeah, can't be bothered. And these guys actually arrested those, uh, if you want to call it that. They caught those guys in the boats and they held them and they called the police on shore and said, please come and get these guys. We caught them now. The police said, okay, we'll come and get them. So they actually had to enforce their own 
lobster territory, that was a club good, they had to enforce their lobster territory because the police would not enforce the law. Okay? And that's not unusual when you have uh, an incompetent or corrupt government. The worst example that I have found, and it's a, a Santa, you see Santa Barbara professors came up with this, it's crazy, was a salmon uh, fishery in Alaska, again, where they had too much effort going in, and they put a quota system in place. Um, yes, they put a quota system in place, but there were still a, a lot of boats crowding out for the, for the salmon run, because the salmon all come at once. The, the season is whatever that is, one month or weeks or something like that. And they would all be out there jumping on top of each other and a lot of effort, a lot of injuries, the fish are getting damaged and so on. And a, a, a lot of the fishermen said, God, this is just dumb. Why don't we just form a co-op? So this half of the fishermen all formed a co-op and they said, we're going to merge all of our permits into one pool and we're going to send off five boats out of 20 and they'll fish for all of us. And we'll share. We'll share the costs and we'll share the profits and so on. And these guys continue to go out there like I call them cowboys. Like, I'm an individual guy, I can go do my thing, I got my quota, and so on. So what happened is, the guys in the co-op, um, they reduced their effort, there were fewer boats, they were better manned, and they had more permits so they could bring in a full load of fish, for example. Uh, and they all worked together and so on, who, all, all kinds of things you can think about. Basically, they were, they were lowering their costs and making good money. These guys were putting in the same old effort because they were just like, you know, they, they couldn't overman their boats. They had as few crew as possible because they want to make as big a profit as possible. And these guys were doing very well. It was still within an ITQ system, right? I believe it's ITQ system. It was still within an IQ, ITQ system. But this group, sorry, you guys are like unluckily on this side of the room. The, the cowboys actually sued in court and won to dissolve the co-op and force them back into their boats. And the reason they could do that is because the law in Alaska says a fisherman has to be on the boat catching fish. So if, if three quarters of you stayed on shore and drank coffee while the other quarter of you went off and caught fish, you are not fishermen drinking coffee. You have to be on the boat, your own boat, hopefully. So these guys sued to force these guys to waste their time basically, and energy. And I believe this is a, a terrible example. I mean, the only thing I could think of is that these guys were winning that competition of stupidity, really. And these guys beat them by being smart. And these guys said, no, you can't be smart. We're going to make you be stupid like us. That was basically what happened. And as far as I know, that is still the case in that, because it, it was the Constitution of Alaska. And, and the, the, court, the, the court literally said, this law is so dumb, but it is the law. So we're going to rule that you have to be dissolved, right? So this is what, where judges are like upset with legislatures. And that will happen. It doesn't make any sense, economically or biophysically. So that's my opening comments, and I will stop for questions. I just said lots of random stuff, so you can ask me questions. You can ask me about water stuff, too, if you want. Yeah. So I think you, you argued in favor of ITQ system. Mm -hmm. um, in the East Coast, anyways, ITQ was given out to small scale fishermen, um, but it became more and more expensive to have an ITQ, and they were mm -hmm. sold to larger and larger fish, fishing companies. Mm -hmm. So while that might um, help enforce the quota system, mm -hmm. it employs fewer people. Right. Because uh, an industrial fishing can employ fewer people. Right. And a lot of individual fishermen. So right. Costs and benefits, yes. Yeah, so, the, uh, um, what's the cost and benefits of, of a community of small fishermen with, who are given ITQs evolving into not much of a community, but kind of an industrial fishing organization that uses the quota, right? Um, the first problem is that you're going to lose a community. And that is, there's two ways to think about it. One is, that's economically efficient, that's great. Uh, I don't have a lot of sympathy for that, because it's tough. On the other hand, keeping fishermen in business in order to keep their community going is a different set of costs. 
So the, the, so the analogy, I'll give you the analogy of, of farming. Because 100 years ago, almost everybody in North America, well, 50% of people in North America were farmers. And now 3% or 2% of people are farmers. And a bunch of people don't want to be farmers. And there's a bunch of industrial farms out there. And so we have a problem of, uh, do we force people to be farmers by essentially making it uh, you know, hard to move to the city, for example, or uh, by not allowing farms to get big so we, the, you know, the labor on the farms is greater so that uh, they can produce enough food for people to eat. It's, it's, it's difficult to find the proper balance between uh, small and, let's say it this way, uh, small and charming and small and backbreaking. Right? Because everybody loves the, the charming side of it, but a lot of farmers are like, man, that's hard work. Uh, so it's, but on the other hand, as far as farming is concerned, there have been a lot of incentives given to farmers to grow larger in scale. So what, what I consider the mid-sized farm, which is going to grow several crops, different types of animals, it's, it's like a mixed-use type of farm, not just someone who's growing some carrots for their salad, but like a, a small-scale, a medium-sized farm. Those farms, I, I would think, would be more efficient in terms of serving local, the local food shed, so to speak. But there are lots of incentives to not be that kind of farmer. So they go from small to being huge, and it's pushed that way also by regulations and incentives. In fisheries, um, that same force can, can occur. The, the ITQ, or the, the quotas that were issued to the, fall, the, the small fishermen, or the regular the fishermen in, with boats, those uh, permits were a way of giving them a property right in the fishery that were sold later on. Some of them may have kept, may have kept there. So say that, you know, say that all of you got quota in a, in a town, a fishing town, and uh, you know, say that you, you four are all good fishermen. And like you're, you're dedicated, you're good, etc. Maybe you're dedicated, maybe you don't care. And so the don't care people say, I'm selling up. So you sell to whoever. The dedicated people who are not working as, as uh, hard or, or, sorry, don't have as much skills or as much you know, determination, they end up saying, boy, it's a lot of competition, I'd rather sell. And then these four end up with all the quota. That is almost a competitive dynamic. What matters next is what happens to the rest of you. If you all move away, and there's just like four little houses or whatever, you know, or you don't even have a village anymore, you just get on the boat and then you go for, for four, four weeks out there on a freezer tra trawler and come back, then that village is gone. You might open a and b You guys might you know, uh, start a coffee shop. You might start doing pottery. I don't even know what it is. It's, the, 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 the jobs for fishermen story is complicated because keeping the fishermen in fish is maybe bad for the fishery and probably bad economically. The, the worst example of this I ever heard was from when the Aral Sea was shrinking. They had a fish packing facility there that was on the old shore. And as the Aral Sea, this is in the old Soviet Union, right? It's in Kazakhstan. The Aral Sea is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And the, 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 there's no fish, and let alone that the actual the Aral Sea is 50 kilometers away from the fish packing plant. Like the, the boats can't just drive up to the dock anymore. It's 50 kilometers away. But in the Soviet Union, they said, but we've got to keep those people employed. So they were flying fish from the Arctic Circle down to the Aral Sea, which is about an eight hour flight, so that those fish packers could work in their fish packing facility. That's an example of keeping the community alive. Right? But it's not exactly, it's certainly not economical or environmental in that sense. Time to move on. So um, that time to move on scenario has happened in farming. It's happened in automobiles. There were over 100 automobile firms at one point. It's happened in restaurants that failed last week downtown. It's happened in schools that have come and gone. It happens all the time. There's nothing unique about that particular fisherman doing that particular job on that particular boat. And so the, I think that that evolution of, of uh, the evolution of scale, let's say, in the fishery is reasonable. 
the only caveat I would say is that you don't want to force it in a direction with a subsidy, for example. Right? You don't subsidize, oh, Chinese investors, we'll give you a million dollar discount on boats or you know, no tax on fish that you land for the first year. This is, this is the kind of the crazy stuff that you don't want to see because it, it makes it worse. And it could actually push it towards larger scale boats when larger scale is not a good idea. So um, that's kind of my half-assed answer. There's no, there's no black and white answer. Um, but fishing communities that can diversify, they get into fresher fish, more diverse, you know, instead of catching a whole bunch of um, whatever it is, cod, let's say, they're going to, you know, get sea urchin or they're going to catch the smaller fish which are not uh, commercial, but then you could have like a local fish specialty or something like that. It's, it's ridiculous. I don't want everybody to become, a, you know, a, a burger flipper in life, but it's kind of, or move into the service economy, so to speak. But there's you, somehow, sometimes, keeping the fishery protected is the number one goal. And if scale changes within that protected fishery, then that's kind of the natural thing. It's a big issue for Canada, I know. Um, but, you know, most of anybody who grew up in BC, if, you're, if your ancestors were loggers, maybe you don't want to be a logger today either. So it's a different problem. Another question? Do we have time also? Okay, 10 more minutes, no problem. I'd love to expand on this, this point from the BC context. Which, yeah. Uh, you know, one of the issues we have is that First Nations people have uh, first crack at salmon, as we discussed. So, under the law of salmon policy, the conservation comes first, second to the Aboriginal right to catch salmon, and then commercial recreation. But if you think of the last century of salmon, they, they move in the opposite direction. They come from the sea, which is where all the commercial uh, and some recreational fishing. Mm -hmm. Capitalistic progression mm -hmm. toward bigger and bigger fishery, fewer people, um, then you trample over the First Nations rights. Right. And so we, it, you're right, it's a big problem in Canada, not in you can think of the beautiful little communities in Newfoundland land and you know, off the island that are, that are disappearing, but then they also have to run back into the original thing. So right now, this is a very active area of lawsuits and um, creativity also. Right. The, the, the fact is, is that very few businesses are in business for 500 years or more, right? The Hudson Bay Company is six, I walked past it yesterday, one store, 1607 or something like that. And they're still in business, right? That's, that they're, they're past 400 years. But they, I don't think they're selling the same stuff today as they did 400 years ago. And they're not even Canadian. I mean, come on. Right? I mean, I think the oldest business in the world is like some soy sauce maker in Japan, right? They're like a thousand years old. So people still eat soy sauce. Um, but most, of, a lot of businesses come and go, and a lot of uh, human habitations come and go, right? And so there, you, you know, the, the Troy, the ruins of Troy, Troy was very famous, and now it's gone. Other many very famous towns are gone. In North America, in some cases, we're not used to that because, you know, a hundred-year-old village, ooh, it's a hundred-year-old village. Well, you know, in, in a lot of parts of the world, a thousand years is, is really old. Damascus is uh, 5,000 years old, according to some people, right? It's a settlement. They've just blown it up recently, which is ups upsetting. But uh, it wasn't there a hundred years ago. And then it was there for 100 years, and now it's going away again, right? Just like any boom town. If you drive up in the Yukon, you see all these old gold prospecting towns. Everybody comes in, makes a lot of money, and leaves. Well, in some cases, fishing towns are just the same thing. And I know that it really is, well, actually, I'm one of the worst people, because I migrate from place to place around the world. I've lived in many cities. But people who like to live in a place, I was born here, my daddy was born here, my daddy's daddies are born here. That is really hard for someone to say, you can live here, but there's no money, no work, you'll starve, right? Of course they want to stay there. It's everything they've ever known. From an emotional perspective, that is very true, very important, and there's not much you can do about it. 
And so some people are they're going to find a way to make it happen. And but sometimes uh, outsiders trying to keep them there, keep them in their comfort zone, so to speak, can, I don't know if that's going to be helpful or harmful. Because if you ask every Canadian, where's your comfort zone, and let me help you out, then, you know, most people are going to be sitting and playing video games, and then who's going to actually produce all the money or whatever, the food, to feed these, to feed you, right? So the uncomfortable thing is you have to get out of bed in the morning and go earn a living. And sometimes your living is going to disappear, after, even if it's after 100 years. Right? Which, is, which is sad. And it's, it's very sad when it disappears by our own ignorance, our own uh, myopia about our, the impacts. What's going on, because I follow water issues all the time, farmers who are using up all of their water and have no water left when there's a drought. In California, they are really, really, really desperate right now because the people who were guaranteed water for 50 years are like, oh, we're not even going to get water. And if farmers can't farm, they're just going to sit there for a year and do this. So they won't die necessarily but they're not going to make any money, and the banks want their money. And the farmers who are not so good, and, or their finances are in bad shape, are going to lose their property, right? It's not always guaranteed. It's the same thing with, oh, house prices only go up, right? Well, what if they drop? People, oh my God, house prices drop. Now that's not good. So the thing is, is that prices do go up and down. Markets come and go. Fashions come and go, which is even worse, like fish oil fashions or whatever, right? So those things are going to come and go and people are going to make money temporarily and, but then you have to know that it might end at some point. And that's the thing, like as an overall idea, keep in mind that you just want to make it easy to be flexible in terms of changing jobs or changing quota or, or changing practices of managing the resource, whether it's water or trees or fish or whatever. And that is, is how people will get along with, with moving and changing with the times. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and then influence the politicians and change a lot of factors. That whole kind of system. If so, if Monsanto, if, who's that? Gordon Fishing, isn't that the name of a fishing company? Gordon Fishing? Who's the, fisher, the, the fishing, frozen fish brand with the fishermen on the front? Greek? What is it? Greek, whatever. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Monsanto Fishing Company. Goes and buys all the quotas, what you're asking, and then says what? I own the quota. I'm going to fish for halibut or salmon, right? And I'm going to sell it for $25 a kilo. $50 a kilo, why not? I own all the quota. How about $100 a kilo? I mean, you can go wherever you want with that, right? But the thing is that you have a monopoly on one fishery or even on one, one reach, right? You don't own all the fish, let alone all the food. So if you go to 100 bucks a kilo, people are going to switch to other fish. And if you own all the fish, they're going to switch to beef. So it's hard to have a monopoly in the fishing industry because it's just a food. You might have a monopoly on the tropical fish industry or something for, for fish tanks. So if they do that, then they might end up buying up all the quota. They've cornered the market, so to speak. And they can't make any more money than market prices will dictate. And they also need fishermen. Right? And, and Monsanto can hire a bunch of fishermen and say, we're paying you a salary and so on and so forth. But the fishermen don't like it. They could go to another fishery. So the fishermen, are, are, they're mobile. They go in a boat. They go somewhere else. Right? So it's hard to exert market power in, in fisheries, except in a local case. Those three, canner, those three uh, freezing plants that were taking the whole halibut fishery, they had significant market power for about one week of the year. But, you know, a couple fisheries over, they, had, they, they didn't even exist, right? They were not in business. Does that kind of answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Another thing, I'll just say one more editorial. Uh, farm salmon are replacing wild salmon. Not necessarily a good idea. There's, like, all kinds of bad shit coming on with farm salmon, uh, let alone the feedstock they use from other fish and so on. So, it, and, and injecting it with dye and all kinds of stuff is crazy. You know, it's like... Yeah, it's just like bad news. But this is, this is, in a sense, this is something that is, a, if you want to call it a political and a market force that's building this up. I don't think the regulators have really caught up with that in a, in a, in a good way. Um, and it's kind of, and, and the industrial fishing people definitely think it's a great idea. So I, I'm, I'm very worried about that because I think there's a lot of pollution from uh, farming salmon that is not part of that discussion. Uh, let alone the, the, the diseases and so on, the parasites that, that harm the wild fish. So, anyway. Well, I can't quite completely there. 
Uh huh. Right. Right. You should be worried. Yeah, that's true. And as a, as another footnote on that, the the the, the putting your competitor out of business um, in California, the water, a lot of water that 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 is wasted flowing in the oceans is is part of salmon uh, streams and salmon fisheries, and a lot of farmers say, don't waste that water in the rivers, put it on our fields, because we employ people, we have jobs, we make food. And the salmon fishermen are like, wait a second. We employ people, we make food, and la la la. So, so actually you've got two parts of the food supply business fighting with each other about this water. But it's, it's crazy, because they're like, you know, we're growing food. It's like, well, we're catching food, you know? So it's, uh, it ends up being kind of silly, you know, if you like fish or cotton more, I guess, is the discussion. All right, I'll stop there. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you.